He was very likable, man. Down to earth and funny. He was very clever, very well read. A brilliant mind, but a brilliant mind the wrong way. Tonight, we investigate one of Ireland's biggest con men. How could a barrister defraud you? There's something about a background like that where you, where you would believe. We reveal his scams stretching over three decades. Everyone was in huge financial difficulties. It was like a drowning man. You'll grasp at any ray of hope. And he gave the rays of hope. He's a man who always assures people their money is on the way. We tell the stories of lives damaged in his wake. There was no grey area. He knew what he was doing. He took advantage of a vulnerable person. It's very really hard to admit to yourself that you could be taken in like that. I'm after going through four or five years of pure hell. And we examine the failure of the authorities to act until it was too late. He got away with it, you know. He's, he had our money, never gave it back to anybody, and was never put behind bars. How? I, I just couldn't understand it. Yeah, how can he get away with it? So who is this con man? Patrick Russell, Paul Murphy here from RT Investigates. I'd like to ask you some questions, Mr. Russell. <laughs> Three weeks ago, Patrick Russell came before Dublin Circuit Criminal Court. His long history as a fraudster was about to catch up with him. But before we come to that, let's start at the beginning. Patrick Russell was born in Dublin in June 1963. His family moved to the working class suburb of Finglas when he was seven and moved in next door to the Wilson family. He was a normal boy, like got up to mischief. Um, he, was, he was always very studious, I suppose. He was always reading. We were friends, we were neighbours, and th those days you had an open door policy. Just come in and out of each other's houses. As part of our research, RTE Investigates searched through court records and files where we came across affidavits in a case lodged in 1994. Esther Wilson is the sister of Margaret and Marion. On the morning of October 17th, 1985, Esther Wilson was cycling to work in Dublin city centre. Her clothing got caught on the back of an articulated truck. We were told to prepare for the worst on that morning. My mum was told to take any family members to the hospital because there was likelihood that Esther wasn't going to make it. We were sitting outside um, waiting to go in and see Esther. And my vision is, or my memory is, of a nurse saying, now, when you go in, you might not recognise Esther. And I'm kind of going, don't be silly, I know my own sister, you know. But when I walked in, I could understand what they meant. And I kind of went, no, that couldn't be my sister. Because her injuries were that bad that she was unrecognisable. Esther survived, but her brain and body were badly damaged. Her injuries resulted in her having um, an acquired brain injury, uh, stroke to the one side, so she's completely paralysed on one side. Esther had to be taught to speak again. She had to be taught to walk again. It was almost like having a baby and starting from scratch, the way you teach your child to walk, you teach your child to speak. But in our case, it was our sister we were teaching. Esther was no longer able to live independently. And in 1988, she received a large compensation settlement this money was to provide for her for the rest of her life and to keep her hopefully in a comfortable lifestyle. The family bought Esther her own home and money was invested in Irish life to help grow her capital. 
The Wilson's next door neighbour, Patrick Russell, had recently graduated with a degree in management from the Dublin Institute of Technology. Okay, now we pause for the actors. Patrick Russell was one of the few from West Finglas who had gone on to third level education at the time. Russell had set himself up as a financial advisor. He approached Esther's mother, offering to invest a large part of her award to get a higher yield. Esther's mother entrusted £120,000, the equivalent of €150,000 to Russell, enough at the time to buy two average houses in Dublin. He came along and he said, I can make the money work best for Esther. And we trusted him. My mum trusted him. She believed what he was telling her. She wouldn't have been educated in the world of finances. So she, you know, she took f his word that he was going to make a better deal for Esther, get a better return on her money to last her her lifetime. Russell made some payments, but they were haphazard. The Wilson said he never provided any documents to show what he had done with Esther's money. When he didn't furnish any documents, we didn't think anything of it because he had said what he was doing, you know, so we took him at his word. When the Wilsons looked for the return of Esther's money, they faced a tactic familiar to many of Russell's future victims. He tried to fob them off. There's always an excuse as to why he couldn't release this capital. It was always, oh, that'll come good. That'll be all right. I'll fix you up. Things just started to, you know, then kind of not make sense as to why he wouldn't accept calls. It was just not right. Esther's mother grew increasingly concerned about her daughter's money. She got scared. She got worried because this was her daughter's life that, again, was being turned upside down. She'd already had an accident and now the money that was there to help her for the rest of her life was in jeopardy. Despite repeated pleas to return the money, Russell kept brushing the family off. Four years after he first received Esther Wilson's money, the family secured a High Court judgment ordering Patrick Russell to repay the family the equivalent of €130,000. Russell made some payments after that. I remember one instant where a large sum of money was just thrown in the letterbox in a brown envelope. £5,000. I happened to be in the house that day and just heard the bang on the door. No explanation, nothing on it. Nothing, you know. I think it was just a handwritten piece of paper. He just said, from Pat. Russell made other smaller payments. Despite the court order, over four years, he repaid the equivalent of just 11,000 euro of the 130,000 owing. How? I, I just couldn't understand it. I could not understand how legally he was not paying this back. You know, how can he get away with it? He was looking at a person in a wheelchair there was no grey area. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he was taking from a vulnerable person. He knew Esther. He knew what her needs would be because it wasn't something that we hadn't discussed. He knew exactly what this money meant to Esther. Around this time, Russell, who had previously been a Sinn Féin activist, was rubbing shoulders with Ireland's political establishment, even creating a business partnership with former Taoiseach Albert Reynolds from around 1996. Both men were involved in a series of dealings, including a failed attempt in 1998 to purchase a Swiss bank, Waco Schweiz, for the equivalent of 27 million euro. Mr. Russell was also a director of a Jersey registered company called Universal Management Consultants, which was also beneficially owned by Albert Reynolds. And this company services didn't come cheap. This 1999 invoice for UMC's consultancy fees for a hotel development in London was for £400,000 sterling, plus expenses. However, Russell was not paying Esther Wilson what he owed her, 
which by 2002 was over €213,000. The Wilson family had to go back to court again to try to force Russell to pay. At this stage, my mum is, what, in her 70s, you know? And she's an elderly woman who should be living a life, not worrying about how she's going to provide for her daughter for the rest of her life. Um, so, yes, she, she had to go back to court and fight again and get another judgment against Mr Russell. The Wilsons finally managed to put a legal and financial gun to Russell's head. They secured an injunction that froze his assets. That meant, for example, he couldn't draw down a mortgage to buy property until he paid up. Russell was caught. In September 2004, 14 years after he had taken the money off his former neighbour, Russell was finally forced to pay all of what he owed. Just days later, Russell paid 2.5 million euro to purchase this house on six acres of land in County Dublin with stables, a tennis court, swimming pool and a ballroom with a purpose-built mahogany bar. He no longer owns this property. The Wilsons were among Patrick Russell's first victims. In a sense, they were also among the luckier ones because they finally got their money back. But the long struggle took its toll on their family. It almost broke us as a family unit because um, when it was discovered that there was this anomaly, um, some of Esther's friends actually thought that we had stolen the money, that we had ripped her off, that we had spent her money. And Esther's mother felt particularly guilty at allowing herself to be duped. It stressed my mum out terrible, you know. I mean, she felt guilty. She, she'll never, ever recover from the deceit, the, the mistrust. She will always, always feel responsible, no matter what. Esther Wilson was happy to have her story told in this programme, but did not wish to be filmed. She now lives life as independently as she can, but she remains in a wheelchair and needs regular care. We tracked down other people and companies who, just like the Wilsons, throughout the 1990s, were forced to take Patrick Russell to court to recover their money. A taxi driver from Wicklow, a shop fitter from Meath, the revenue commissioners, a drinks company, two banks, a builder, all took Patrick Russell to court to try to force him to pay a combined sum of around €800,000. All of these cases happened before 2001. This was a big year for Patrick Russell. He qualified as a barrister. This man has had judgments against him and he's actually practicing law. I, I couldn't believe it. I found that very, very difficult. We asked the Bar Council of Ireland, which represents practising barristers, for an interview to talk about Patrick Russell. They said, the Bar of Ireland does not comment on individual barristers, either current or past members. Becoming a barrister was a key turning point for Patrick Russell, not as a lawyer, but as a con man. His dishonesty was about to become much more organised and on a much bigger scale. In part two, we see just how big. In 2006, David MacDonald was running two refrigeration businesses in Leinster when he met barrister Patrick Russell. He came across as a down to earth straight shooter. Very much a spit in the ground type of barrister. That he's a, he is a man of the people and he gave the African impression completely. Uh, that's another thing that sucks you in. He is, he doesn't talk down to you, he talks with you. Both of David McDonald's refrigeration companies owed significant sums in tax, and they hired Russell to help them negotiate with the revenue commissioners. We weren't trying to avoid the revenue or anything like that. We just wanted to get the best possible solution to, to our problem. We, we trust him, and from the start, he was absolutely convincing. 
Aside from being a barrister, Russell had set himself up as a tax agent and said he had contacts in the revenue and that he could get a good deal. And again, that was his appeal. You know, you feel like there's someone in there in the establishment who's going to be fighting for you. You know, he has these contacts in revenue and you know, he's not going to be pushed around. And he gave you that impression that he was the man for the job. Within hours of David MacDonald making the initial contact with Patrick Russell, Russell had seemingly taken the first steps with revenue. He said he had made, already made contact with revenue and there was a deal on the table, but he was going to meet him, something to that effect, but I need uh, 80,000 tomorrow. And we didn't have 80,000 to spare, uh, but we got her 80 grand and gave it to him the following day. So then he knew that he had it. Russell asked David MacDonald to make the cheque out to him. He, you know, he explained to us, no, it'll have to go into my bank account. I am your agent now. Uh, so I'll be dealing with the revenue, and therefore, in order for me to get the best deal, you know, I need to be the front face. And when he explained it that way, he said, OK, if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. Time went on and a deal still wasn't finalised. David MacDonald was getting a little suspicious. He met Patrick Russell to seek assurances. Russell then called someone he said was in the revenue. And then he just made the phone call. Put this guy on the phone and uh, very believable, like, you know, yeah, Pat is doing a good job for you, that type of thing. Yes, uh, we're, the negotiations are coming to a conclusion. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, we should be able to finish it off with Pat. By August 2007, David MacDonald's companies had paid €775,000 to Patrick Russell to pay their tax liabilities and another €48,000 in fees. But David MacDonald's suspicions didn't completely go away and he sought proof that this money had actually been paid over. Russell then sent a fax of what appeared to be receipts on revenue-headed notepaper. In one of the faxed letters received by David MacDonald was an acknowledgement that the money was in full and final settlement of all tax liabilities. When we got the letters from the revenue, we believed that Russell had done a good job for us, but we'd always put our faith in him. So it was good, it was fantastic relief, of course, yeah. The relief was short-lived. Three months later, in November 2007, David MacDonald received liquidation papers in the post. The revenue was applying to the High Court to wind up one of his company's Ardline for unpaid tax liabilities. Disbelief, complete disbelief. We were just incredulous, like, you know, we, we, we couldn't believe, you know, what's going on. The following morning, David MacDonald drove to the revenue office to see what was happening. And they opened the files for us. There was one piece of paper in it. There wasn't any uh, rece receipts for money paid. It was one of the receipts that Russell had given us. And there, that feeling in your stomach that you had for months, uh, you sort of said, well, your stomach was right, not your head. Yeah, that was the, that was the ultimate, the moment when you knew you were, you were in real trouble. David MacDonald phoned Russell. Even though the game was up, Russell stuck to his story. He maintained that the money had been handed over and promised to go to the headquarters of the Revenues Collector General in Limerick to fix things. We get Russell on the phone and I'm explaining to him about the files and he said, I oh, know there must be a mistake here. But that he was on his way to Limerick that he would sort it out that there's some mistake. But Patrick Russell was lying. The €775,000 that McDonald's companies had paid to cover their tax liabilities was never passed on to revenue. The letters from Revenue that had given David MacDonald such assurance three months earlier were fake. The money was gone. Revenue still needed to be paid. When the Revenue perceived that, you know, that we weren't paying them anything, that's when they went straight to the High Court. So there was no negotiation in between. Just absolute helplessness. The whole thing just fell apart. 
well, you're, you, you've lost control of your life, really. So there you are, and that's what he does. You've, you've put your trust in somebody to do a job for you, and it's completely a, a lie. You know what I mean? Just one big lie. But it's a, you know, it's a heavy lie, so you're not going to come back from that. Just no way back from that. Ultimately, David MacDonald's main company, REL, went into examinership. It survived, but he is no longer an owner. The other company, Ardline, was liquidated. During High Court proceedings, Russell was ordered to repay the Ardline company the hundreds of thousands of euro he had received from it. Russell promised to do so. When he didn't, he was jailed for contempt of court. It was Russell's second time to be jailed for contempt. He would spend several weeks in custody before being released, but he still didn't repay the money. The High Court judge Peter Kelly said that there was little doubt that a fraud had occurred in this case. The Garda National Economic Crime Bureau, known as the Fraud Squad, did investigate but their investigation did not result in a prosecution. Extensive uh, interviews with them, um, uh, gave them all the information we had, documentation, whatever. And so we kept constant contact with the fraud squad. They documented everything and nothing. No, and I couldn't understand that part. In our case, there was so much evidence and so many people to interview. Even I would have made a decent effort at convicting them on the evidence that we had. With hindsight, David MacDonald blames himself for having put his faith in Patrick Russell. When you think back on it, like, there's so many small things you would have, should have challenged. Uh, but I do think, why was I so naive with him, maybe? You look back into yourself, saying, how could you let a, a fellow like that get away with what he did, you know? Uh, but he was brilliant, you know what I mean? He was an absolute brilliant con man, like, you know what I mean? As simple as that. Patrick Russell's scams only work when people trust him. David MacDonald trusted Patrick Russell because he was a barrister and he had been recommended by his father, Tom MacDonald. Tom MacDonald had previously hired Russell to negotiate a revenue debt. When he recommended him to his son, he believed that he had done a good job, but it was only after David MacDonald realised that he had been duped that his father discovered that he too had been scammed. He hurt my father much more than he hurt me. That's for certain. Decimated him, like, you know. He was a decent age, like, that time, you know, so... There's only so much you can go through, you know, yourself. The scam was the same. Russell was acting as Tom MacDonald's tax agent, taking €355,000 from him to cover a revenue liability. And as with his son, he issued falsified tax receipts. As with David MacDonald's companies, Tom MacDonald's tax liability remained after he had been scammed of hundreds of thousands of euro. The revenue still had to be paid. He took, he took his life savings, in other words, really, to pay the tax man, because the tax man, you know, the same story, hard luck. We, we hear you, but we don't hear you. You know, you, it's your tax agent, not ours, so you've given the money to the tax agent, therefore, I'm sorry, sir. You know, you still owe us that, which is, again, that's the rules of the road. You can't blame the revenue for that. So you had to pay them on the double, in other words. Tom MacDonald, who is now deceased, also made a statement to the fraud squad in 2008 and supplied proof of payment and fake receipts. But again, Russell was not prosecuted. He still got away with it, you know. He, he had our money, never gave it back to anybody uh, and was never put behind bars for it. Patrick Russell defrauded others with a similar scam. The MO was usually the same, fake contact with the revenue and fake documents. Russell took 100,000 euro from musicians Foster and Allen and a further 580,000 euro from Westmeath musician Paul Griffin, who died last year. In a separate property scam, he took 400,000 euro from pro golfer Damien McGrain. All of these people gave statements to the fraud squad, but Russell was still not prosecuted. As his fraud was now running into millions, we wanted to know why not. When Gorda Siakona did not agree to provide a representative for interview, 
But in a statement, they said that in 2008, Garthi commenced a criminal investigation into a number of allegations, as a result of which in 2015, an extensive investigation file was submitted to the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. The Office of the DPP directed no prosecution in these cases. The statement went on to say, Angartha Siakona does not comment on decisions or correspondence with the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. So why did the DPP not prosecute after the seven-year Garda investigation? The DPP said it does not comment on individual cases. Some cases like that of entertainer Declan Nerny, who lost €940,000 to Russell, were reported in the media. RTE investigates uncovered others. Russell took €500,000 from a Midlands doctor, €100,000 from a Dublin-based barrister, €50,000 from an Offaly businessman, and around €800,000 from a Leinster businesswoman. Another arm of the state, the Revenue Commissioners, was also well aware of Russell because several of his victims met personally with revenue officials. Those officials had seen letters and receipts that Russell had supplied to clients and would have immediately recognised them as false. We asked Revenue to do an interview about its knowledge of Russell's scams and what steps it took to stop him. Revenue said it is legally prevented from making any comment in relation to specific cases. By now it was 2007, and though he was not prosecuted in court, Patrick Russell was becoming more visible. RTE's primetime first exposed him in August 2007, featuring a Meath builder Bobby Farrell, who claimed Patrick Russell took €109,000 from him. That cheque is gone now. So Russell took your money? Russell's gone with the money. He changed it, and it's in his account now, wherever that may be. Primetime came back to the subject again in 2008. And coming up later, we're on the front line of the battle against bad legal practice. We bring in the bizarre tale of barrister Patrick Russell. By 2008, Russell had stopped practicing as a barrister, and in 2012, his own profession finally dealt with him conclusively. He became the first ever barrister in Ireland to be struck off. He was disbarred for professional misconduct. According to the decision of the King's Inns, he had lied to a client and engaged in continued deception. But Russell carried on a pretense of being a barrister. This email receipt shows that he paid for a membership upgrade of the reputable International Bar Association in June 2014, more than two years after his disbarment. Patrick Russell, however, had still not been charged with any criminal offence for fraud or theft. He had relocated to Manchester away from a growing number of people who were looking for their money back. When he returned to operate in Ireland around 2013, he began using a new name, Joseph Russell, and he had developed a new scam. In part three, we look at this new scam, targeted at people deep in debt and struggling. Patrick Russell's new scam was offering loans to farmers like Felix O'Mahony and small businesses that needed money at a time when mainstream banks had slashed new lending in the wake of the financial crisis. O'Mahony is a farmer and livestock dealer from Killinall in Tipperary. He lives here on land that his family have farmed for seven generations. I was going to lose the whole lot, everything. Which of the banks had me under pressure every day of the week. I was supposed to vacate the property. I was under pressure, serious financial pressure. It was not a great feeling to think you're going to be out on the side of the road tomorrow morning. It's a really bad feeling. And then Patrick Russell came into his life. And I was looking for a way out. And a friend of mine said that he had met Pat Russell in the hospital in Tala. And this man might be the answer to your problems. And when you're under that pressure, you'll do anything. You'll grasp at any straw, any ray of hope. And he gave the rays of hope. Russell came across as clever and well-connected. He seemed to know what he was talking about. He had a very, very able mind. He was very clever, very well-read, a brilliant mind. 
for her brilliant mind the wrong way. Russell promised a €320,000 loan to Felix O'Mahony, which would allow him to pay off his existing lenders and give him breathing space to save his home and his farm. O'Mahony got this letter of offer from P2P Finance Limited. Russell's P2P Finance is not to be confused with other legitimate UK companies with a similar name, which have no connection to Patrick Russell. It looked very good at the time because you could get no money off a bank here. I'm out of trouble if I get this. I thought this was, I was able to pay off all my debts with this money and I'd get 10 years to pay it back. It looked like it was a dream. And should have dreamed it turned into a nightmare. That's what it was. Felix O'Mahony had thought his financial problems were about to be sorted, thanks to Patrick Russell, and he introduced Russell to friends who, like him, were facing financial difficulties. I introduced him to a very good friend of mine, thinking he'd get him out of trouble. And then I introduced him to another man, good friend of mine again, in Kildare, thinking he'd get him out of trouble. And then his circle grew out of that. Everybody introduced him to somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. That's how his circle got so big. Felix O'Mahony believed in Russell, and Russell drew him closer, asking him to drive him around and meet with clients. He says he was sometimes paid for his work as a driver. Because he's a livestock dealer as well as a farmer, Felix O'Mahony has farming contacts around Ireland. He used me. He used me to gain credibility with those people because he knew I could talk to him about farming and I was able to empathise with them people, but I knew the problems they had. RTE Investigates spoke to 22 people who signed up with Russell's P2P Finance. People like Wicklow businessman Jimmy Kavanagh, Westmead livestock dealer Ian McLaughlin, Derry farmer David Norris. All 22 paid advance fees for the loans being offered. Most of those paid between 5,000 and 10,000 euro, others paid over 40,000 euro. All received letters of loan offer, most of which presented P2P as an English-based company. We wanted to see if we could trace any connections with Russell's P2P Finance Limited. Our search brought us here. We've just arrived to 130 Congleton Road in Sandbach, south of Manchester, which was the address on Felix O'Mahony's letter of loan offer. But the building is no longer here. It's been demolished and replaced by new houses. Another address used by P2P Finance on its letters of offer was here at Plotter Lane in Bolton which is the address of construction firm Seddon. Seddon told us that they had no idea that Patrick Russell was using their address. And unsuspecting too were would-be borrowers like Felix O'Mahony, who unless they actually visited here, would have no idea that this was not the address of a lender, but was the address of a construction firm. When we talked to Seddon, we learned that they too are chasing Patrick Russell for money. In a statement, the company said, we are aware of Patrick Russell and our experience has not been a positive one. Mr. Russell owes the business money, and we're currently endeavouring to recover the outstanding amount. Five years ago, Felix O'Mahony still believed that P2P Finance was a legitimate lender, but his faith in Patrick Russell was starting to recede as the promised money failed to arrive. When the money was slow coming through, I had suspicions then. Well, I didn't want to believe me on suspicions because they were, the, they were my lifeline at the time, this supposed money. And I kept hoping and hoping. Whenever a client of P2P contacted Russell with concerns that their money had not arrived, he was quick to text or email reassurance. The money was always coming tomorrow. And if it wasn't tomorrow, it would be Wednesday of next week. And to see an escrow account or to see or to there, between his health and technical problems, I never heard as many excuses. Another P2P client who did not wish to be identified showed us text messages from Russell. He strung them out for nearly two and a half years, always reassuring them their money was on the way, but it never came. 
Russell, who often used his alias Joseph Russell in official correspondence, told his clients he had access to large sums of money to finance their loans. This is Gordon Craig, a businessman based in Britain. Patrick Russell told his Irish P2P clients that Gordon Craig was the funder of P2P Finance Limited. He was supposedly the man providing the money for their loans. Patrick Russell even sent on emails to clients purporting to be from Gordon Craig to convince people the money was coming, but all was not as it seemed. In fact, Gordon Craig would become another casualty of Russell. Around June 2016, Russell's clients were getting more worried that loans they had paid fees for weren't coming. He needed to allay their fears. It was time to bring the supposed funder Gordon Craig to Ireland and introduce him to them. The purpose of bringing Gordon Craig over was to convince everybody that he met that the ball was still rolling and that this was the man with the money and this was the man who was funding P2P loans. However, there was much more to the Gordon Craig story than Patrick Russell was telling. So we've come to the town of Chorley, about 25 miles north of Manchester, with some questions for Mr Craig. Principally, was he ever involved with P2P finance? Was he the funder of P2P finance? And did he visit Ireland on behalf of P2P in order to meet potential clients? When we approached Gordon Craig, he was willing to talk to me, would not go on camera. He did confirm that while he knew Patrick Russell, he was not involved in P2P finance and was never a funder of P2P. He also said that these emails which I showed him, which were sent to P2P clients in Gordon Craig's name, were not genuine. They were not sent by him and they were not sent from his email account. We showed a series of six photos to Irish P2P clients who were introduced to the supposed funder, Gordon Craig. Included was a picture of the real Gordon Craig. None identified him as the man that Patrick Russell introduced them to. So the Gordon Craig that Russell introduced P2P clients to was in fact an imposter. But they didn't know this, so it meant that Patrick Russell could keep people's hopes up and keep collecting fees from them. He was able to go back and get more money on the, on the, on the strength of that from the people. He introduced this fake Gordon Craig too. He was able to go back, he'd get another 5,000 or another 2,000 or 3,000 or 10,000. He didn't care how much. All he wanted was money. Gordon Craig wasn't Patrick Russell's only fabrication designed to convince people there was money to lend. This email, allegedly from Barclays Bank, confirmed that P2P had access to three chunks of £5 million sterling, 15 million in total. Russell sent on the email to P2P clients in Ireland. When we contacted Barclays, they told us that the email was not a genuine email and it would be referred to their fraud team. People around Ireland waiting on Russell's P2P Finance Limited loans never got them. The funding was never there. The letters of offer were bogus. But should it turned out that the, the letter wasn't genuine. The letter of offer wasn't genuine. There was, there was no P2P. When we looked up all those things later, of course, when we all got suspicious, there was no, no registered company P2P. Combined, the 22 victims of the P2P scam that we spoke to paid Russell €375,000 for non-existent loans. Felix O'Mahony was a victim of a double scam by Patrick Russell. Russell didn't have his own bank account, so he would sometimes ask people to lodge cheques to Felix O'Mahony's bank account. O'Mahony had same-day cheque clearance on his account. That meant he could withdraw money from his bank as soon as the cheque was lodged. He didn't have to wait for it to clear. You'd get a man to lodge a cheque in some place up the country. And I had same-day clearance on my cheques. I could go in, the minute the cheque would be lodged, I could go into my bank and draw out cash. And that I did. And Russell would be waiting outside to give him his money. But within a week, six of those cheques bounced. And before Felix O'Mahony realised this, he had given Russell thousands on the strength of the dud cheques. And 
I was caught to the tune of 60,000. Patrick Russell has not returned this money to Felix O'Mahony, and O'Mahony's bank is still looking for its money back. O'Mahony has been tainted in other ways by his association with Russell. Because he was driving Russell around and sometimes accepted money from clients on his behalf, some felt he was an agent for Russell. Absolutely not. I was never an agent for Patrick Russell. Never. Never. No, 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 no. I, I met people with him. He would bring me with him to farmers that he'd be settling debts for because he knew I could talk about farming. And I was, I was of use to him that way. That, that's all. I was never an agent for Paddy Russ. No, 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 no. It's very hard to admit to yourself that you were defrauded in that way, that you could be taken in like that. It's very hard to admit that to yourself. Well, people don't trust you as much after you have an association with somebody like Patrick Russell. No, no, nobody trusts you after something like that. And what about the people that Felix O'Mahony introduced to Patrick Russell? You'd be disgusted for introducing him. You'd be, you'd be oh, you'd always feel you're all a great. And I brought him to people in good faith, thinking he'd settle up their problems. And he made problems. But when I look back at it after, I was only a tool for him. I was giving him a little bit of credibility at the time, and I'm disgusted with myself for having done that. So why is he doing this interview? You won't get too many people to come on the programme and tell the truth about themselves with Patrick Ross. I'm only doing it for one reason and one reason only, to make sure that he never, ever does it to anybody again. I don't mind being called a fool if I could spare someone else the hassle and the trouble that that man put on to people. Felix O'Mahony still hasn't gotten his money back from Patrick Russell. He ended up getting finance with another lender, but the time wasted waiting on his P2P loan that never arrived cost him tens of thousands of euro, he believes, and years of stress. He's a bad man with a brilliant mind, and he's able to cover his tracks wherever he goes. If ever you wanted to meet Jekyll and Hyde, he is Jekyll and Hyde. He can convince people he'll do good. But Mr Hyde has never fell away. But Patrick Russell didn't cover all of his tracks. Our investigation found he left a trail of fake documents linked directly to him. Take this High Court order in a case he had pretended to take. He wanted to show his client that he won a High Court award on their behalf. The order is a fake. Or this tenancy agreement that Russell was using to help him sell a building in Dublin that he didn't own. This document is also a fake. Or this debt write-down agreement with AIB which Russell had allegedly negotiated on behalf of a farmer. Russell sought fees for his work in achieving this write-down. Again, it's a fake. There were other fake AIB documents which triggered a nationwide alert by the bank in 2015, warning officials not to deal with Patrick Russell. AIB also informed Garthi, but again, in this case, there was no prosecution. And in 2015, Patrick Russell used fake documents in another scam and made his biggest mistake. He was finally about to face criminal charges, not for any of the cases we have already featured, but for an entirely different case. Paul O'Connell runs a trucking company in Kildare. In 2015, he paid Patrick Russell €235,000 to buy an industrial unit for him. Russell provided property documents to say O'Connell was the new owner of this unit, but the documents were fake. Russell hadn't bought the unit as instructed. He had stolen Paul O'Connell's money. Dardy were alerted. Four years after the crime in 2019, Russell pleaded guilty to a charge of theft. But sentencing him was not straightforward. The first sentencing hearing we attended was on November 4th, 2019. Patrick Russell was not sentenced today. 
He secured an adjournment on medical grounds. I'm just out of courtroom number five, where Patrick Russell's legal representative gave the judge a certificate stating that he is unwell. Russell's case was back before the courts again in June, but he managed to get another adjournment. And again in October, still no resolution. It's November 4th, 2020, and Patrick Russell is before the criminal courts again today. It's been a full year since he was originally supposed to have been sentenced. As Patrick Russell walked into the criminal court three weeks ago, the 57-year-old didn't know that this would be his last day of freedom for some time. Patrick Russell has finally been sentenced. Judge Melanie Greeley imprisoned him for four years with the final year suspended. His actions, she said, were a grave breach of trust that involved considerable deceit and dishonesty. Paul O'Connell was among the latest in a long line of people defrauded by Patrick Russell. The others never got justice. In the course of this investigation, we spoke to over 60 men and women that Russell defrauded. Altogether, we found evidence he stole over 8 million euro. His victims came from all over Ireland and from all walks of life. Farmers, builders, hoteliers, shop owners, mechanics, married, single, widowed. At least 20 victims reported Russell to Garthi. If something had been done about him earlier, Paul O'Connell may not have been defrauded. Patrick Russell declined a request for interview, so we put questions to him after one of his court appearances. Patrick Russell, Paul Murphy here from RT Investigates. I'd like to ask you some questions, Mr. Russell. Do you have anything to say to the people that you've stolen money from, uh, defrauded money from over the years? No comments. Uh, we've spoken to over 60 people who say that you've defrauded them. Do you have anything at all to say to them, some of them very desperate people that you took money from? No comments. Have you anything at all to say, for example, to the people who uh, thought they were borrowing money from P2P Finance? These were people in desperate a debt situation, people who paid you money for loans. They didn't get anything because there was no money. Do you have anything to say to those people, Mr. Russell? No comments. What about, Mr. Russell, to your own, your, your own uh, neighbour, the person you grew up beside, uh, Esther Wilson, a disabled woman? You made her fight for 10 years, Mr. Russell, to get her money back. Have you anything to say to her or to her family? Patrick Russell is now in prison for one crime, but his actions have left dozens of lives and livelihoods deeply damaged. He knew what he was doing was wrong. He knew he was telling a lie. But he didn't give a damn about the consequences for the people he was taking money off once Pat Russell went home with money in his pocket every day. How he got it didn't matter. He's slipped under so many radars over the years. Um, I, I actually don't know how he's got away with it this long, you know, and how he hasn't been taken to task before this. There are serious questions about the state's handling of the case of Patrick Russell, a prolific fraudster. What did the revenue commissioners do to stop a man when they knew he had defrauded so many? by using fake revenue receipts and bogus letters and emails from apparent revenue addresses? And why, despite a large amount of documentary evidence and victim statements available to Garthi and the Director of Public Prosecutions, did it take so long to finally prosecute Patrick Russell? <laughs>